Hello, everyone, and welcome to this installation of uh, the Harry Frank Guggenheim Foundation Knowledge Against Violence speaker series. My name is Nialeti Hanwana. I'm a program officer here at the Harry Frank Guggenheim Foundation, and I'm pleased to welcome you all today to Conflict and Climate, How Global Warming Leads to Global Violence. Um, I do think perhaps though that does global warming lead to global violence may have been a more appropriate title for this conversation. You'll see from this conversation today that our speakers will complicate this premise and offer us alternative ways to better understand the connections between conflict and climate. Um, and so for those of you who are unfamiliar with the work of the Harry Frank Guggenheim Foundation, um, allow me to briefly talk a bit about the foundation and what we'd like this uh, Knowledge Against Violence speaker series space to be. Um, the foundation examines enduring and urgent problems of violence. Through basic and applied research, we aim to understand the causes, manifestation, and control of violence. We spread this knowledge to inform policy, practice, and public discourse, and to advance scholarship. Drawing from the Foundation's vast pool of scholars, grantees, and colleagues, speakers discuss timely research and analysis of situations of violence, including war, crime, terrorism, intimate relationships, climate instability, instability like the conversation we'll have today, and political extremism. Our hope is that this informative space leads to knowledge sharing, and we therefore encourage you in the audience to pose questions, to share comments, and to share relevant resources in the Zoom chat function. Before we get into the program, I'd like to briefly run through the session's agenda. So we'll start today with a moderated discussion that will take us to the end of the hour. During that conversation, as I mentioned, I encourage you to uh, pose questions using that Q&A function at the bottom of your Zoom window. If you have any questions on how to do so, please feel free to write uh, to us in the chat. Uh, we'll use the chat function, though, predominantly to answer any AV or technical questions um, and share resources, speaker bios, and other information during the course of the session. So following that moderated portion of the discussion, speakers will have a further 30 minutes to answer the questions that have come, come in during um, during the moderated portion of the of the conversation. So the discussion which is being recorded will be made available on hfg.org. And so we hope that you will then visit HFG's website, learn more about the other opportunities that we have um, and watch other events that we've hosted uh, in recent months. So with that, I'd like to invite each of our speakers to please turn on their cameras as I briefly introduce them. Their full bios will be shared in the chat as well. Great. So Dr. Marwa Daoudi is an associate professor of international relations at Georgetown University School of Foreign Service and the Saif Gobash chair in Arab studies at the Center for Contemporary Arab Studies and a 2023-2024 Wilson Center Global Fellow. Dr. Daoudi's research and teaching focus on critical and human security, environmental and water politics, climate security, and Middle Eastern politics. Her second book on the origins of the Syrian conflict, climate change, and human security won the 2020 Harold and Margaret Sprout Prize by the International Studies Association and was awarded for the best, is, which is awarded for the best books in the field of environmental studies. Welcome, Dr. Daoudi. Dr. Sarah Njeri, who is our moderator today, is a lecturer in humanitarianism and development at SOAS at the University of London. A peace and conflict scholar by training, she is an interdisciplinary researcher whose research sits at the intersection between academia, policy, and practice. And her research employs a critical lens in investigating the implications of explosive remnants of war in post-conflict environments, as well as how the implementation of programs to address these same uh, mimic the liberal peace building critiques. She has extensive research experience in Somaliland, Tanzania, Ethiopia, Angola, and Cambodia. Welcome, Dr. Njeri. Finally, Dr. Javier Puente is an, an associate professor and chair of the Latin American and Latino Latina Studies program at Smith College. He is an interdisciplinary scholar of Andean environments and campesino politics. His first book, The Rural State, Making Comunidades, Campesinos and Conflict in Peru's Central Sierra from the University of 
Texas Press received the 2023 Marisa Navarro Best Book Award of the New England Council of Latin American Studies. Welcome to you all. And Dr. Njeri, I'll pass the virtual mic to you to lead us through the moderated portion of the discussion. Thank you very much uh, for the lovely introduction. And also thank you for inviting us uh, to this very important discussion today. As you will have heard um, um, from Nyeleti, everyone, that Javier and Marwa are two academic experts who have a, a broad wealth of, of knowledge between them, and I'm looking forward to, to the discussion. Um, and I think I will, I will start with uh, Marwa, if I may, uh, and, and I'm, I'm, I want us to, to hear from you what the dominant narratives that are driving the international agendas on climate change are. Thank you. Thank you very much, Sarah. Thank you for moderating this uh, this important conversation. It's a pleasure to be here, and I want to thank Nieleti also for the invitation. And uh, also being with Javier on the panel is is very thrilling and exciting. Um, I think the, the what drove me actually to uh, to the field of climate security, etc., is the fact that I've encountered narratives which I will describe as deterministic, essentialist. Uh, which tend to think that because there is climate change, of course there is climate change, but because there is climate change, there will be increased heat, um, increase in temperatures, decrease in precipitations, especially in already, you know, uh, struck countries, and we think about the global south, right, countries, that will lead to big migration flows towards the global north, hence insecurity for the global north. And so when I encounter that narrative, I really think we need to debunk it because there are many, many intervening variables here. And again, it's penalizing those who are the most impacted by climate change, those who already encounter drought and scarcity, et cetera, without questioning the reasons for it, the roots of, of the, these vulnerabilities. So in my work, I, I decided to really go into the historical analysis, and we have a historian here on the panel who will provide that historical depth, but also to look into to all of the different variables that come to play. And again, government policies play a role. Uh, there's no deterministic approach here, which is uh, important to debunk. And I will speak later on to how it was applied to the Syrian conflict and wrongly applied to say that was a climate-driven conflict, hence migration, hence the migrants are sources of instability. And this is leading also to very racialized exclusionary policies racializing borders, and we see it happening in Europe, for example, the fear, the politics of fear, the fear of uh, floods of migrants, which has not happened. There are migrants, but they are not floods of migrants, and they're not climate-driven migrants often. Uh, they're, they're you know, fleeing conflicts, uh, fleeing insecurity, economic, political insecurity, and, and hence creating fortresses on the ground that because of climate change, because of migration, the wealthy nations need to protect themselves against the flow of the poor, of the migrants coming from the poorer countries, where in fact, we should think, why are they uh, migrating? What is the problem? And I think this will be also the object of our discussion. Thank you, Myra. And, and I think the audience, especially in places, for example, where I'm based in, in the UK, um, I'm joining in from, from Nairobi uh, this, this evening, extremely hot, will, you know, some of those uh, debates will resonate or some, some of those uh, issues that you're raising will resonate with them. And thank you as well for noticing that I, I did not invite you to, you know, to, 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 to introduce yourself and to bring uh, the, you know, to, to, to tell us what brings into your work, which you've be beautifully done. And I'll, I'll, I'll do the same with Javier and, you know, I'll say, please introduce yourself and tell us what brings you into this area of work. Thank you. Thank you, Sarah. Thank you, Sarah. Thank you. Um, it's such a pleasure and a privilege to share in the floor with um, you, Sarah, and, and, and Marwa. Um, yes, as I, it has been mentioned a couple of times, I am trained as a historian. Um, I My preliminary work has been grounded on past experiences of uh, social political struggles, primarily by indigenous and campesino peoples of the Andes. Um, in recent years, I've been transitioning to environmental questions pertaining to not only land, but on the water regimes that um, um, govern um, land exploitation. Um, and, you know, when you look at water, you have to uh, almost unavoidably look at climate. 
And ultimately, you end up looking at these sort of like indispensable adaptations for livelihoods to um, emerge and consolidate, despite uh, uh, events that we consider to be catastrophic, and sometimes because of these events that we consider to be catastrophic. And and to just um, chime in about the question on on dominant narratives, um, I, I really appreciate Marwa's uh, preceding comment about, you know, the need for debunking climate induced violence. I, I think components of this understanding of climate induced violence. Um, are, uh, for instance, um, uh, something that many, many scholars have observed um, in, in different latitudes, this adamant endeavor of um, um, discourses of power to naturalize catastrophes, right? To um, uh, be sure that um, events of different kinds, whether they are droughts, floods, um, earthquakes, they are perceived and presented as some sort of inexorable event uh, an implaca implacable experience of nature upon societies. Um, in, in this naturalization, I, I think there is no real appraisal of the responsibility of the structures of power and production of capital that govern these societies and how those structures are more related to the effects and the impacts of these uh, events than, than the event itself, right? That's, that's what I would call uh, this, this naturalization of catastrophes. And I think the other dominant narrative that um, I, I wish to unpack, not only with Marwa and with you, Sarah, but also with the audience, is a certain obsession with, with data collection, right? So particularly in, in, um, in confronting the contemporary um, climate crisis that, that we're um, experiencing these days, there's a certain um, overemphasis, I would say, with continuing and deepening our data collection. Right? We need to understand more and understand more. And, and I think that's in incredibly valuable. I do not mean to underestimate the work of um, so many scientists, natural and social, who are constantly providing us with um, more accurate understandings of, of the catastrophe that lies um, not only ahead, but in between us. But you know, sometimes I, I wonder, like, how much more data do we need before moving from data collection to action? Right, and I think this sort of like emphasis on data collection um, ends up favoring this idea that all of these events, all of these occurrences, are natural uh, in essence. Uh, and I think these essentializations, and, and I, I think that's an, an unintended um, consequence of, of of data collection as a as a as a political endeavor. But um, I think they create major flaws in the current evaluation of these catastrophes, past and present. That, that's a, that's a, an interesting observation, especially on data, because I think we, we we are living in a world now where you know there is a continuation of 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 you know in every sector in every field you know like we need more data to be able to answer this. But the data is, uh, for example, today in Nairobi where I'm sat with extremely hot and loads and loads of mosquitoes. So I'm 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 here to um, uh, to host a workshop with colleagues from a, a, uni a local university, and two of my colleague, uh, one of my colleagues from who is traveling from Brazil, cannot attend because she's uh, she suffered from uh, dengue a fever, and that uh, the extent to which you know these these uh, outbreaks of things like these are related to climate and 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 are evidence of the data that we need to to act. Or, or, or to uh, undertake mitigation is 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 out there. So uh, Mara, I see that you've uh, unmuted yourself. I, I'm sure you wanted to jump yes, in. Yes, I, I want to just comment on on what you just yeah. said, Sarah, and Javier's point. Very very important point. Uh, first, your point about the fever just shows that when we think about climate security, climate cha change, it's it's there are many many intertwined variables here. It's about health. It's about um, and food, it's about water, it's about livelihoods, it's about sovereignty, it's about emancipation as well. So I'm thinking all of these issues are very, very important. And I just wanted to add to the comment that was made. Um, it's the dominant narratives. It's very interesting to see that 20, 30 years ago, we used to talk about water wars, right? Saying uh, the scarcity of water will lead to wars between riparian states, between warring states, etc. And there was again a deterministic a perspective which fed on the idea, which was also neo Malthusian. It was feeding on the idea that there will be population growth, so more pressure is on very scarce resources such as water, uh, agricultural, etc. Hence, again, people growing too much in the global south and impacting the wealth and the livelihoods of the wealthy global north. 
that led that was debunked already like there was a lot of literature academic literature showing that the water wars did not happen uh, and that despite the fact of scarcity there could be cooperation although of course some parties tend to over exploit that moved on recently with the climate security discourse and again it's it's sort of a neo Malthusian perspective not talking about growth but talking about population mobility and flows and saying again those flows it's about growth but it's also about mobility towards uh, the wealthy nations which again frame it and and uh, as as the politics of fear saying this there will be floods of migrants because of climate change we need to protect these very you know wealthy um, uh, civilized between quote unquote uh, societies against these floods and in that case uh, climate change becomes a threat and Nieletti started the discussion by saying um, we need to really question the title the initial title because it's not about climate change creating global violence and the assumption is you will see some articles there were like a few years ago articles about how heat makes people angry you know the link between heat and anger and where where are the cases in Africa in the Middle East in a lot of the countries in the global south with the assumption that they are permanently angry and potentially sources of conflicts so I really think we need to nuance all of that and I'm happy for the conversation that we're having today to be able to really go into the nuances and the historical also relevance of all these points Thank you. Yeah, actually, that you know, you've made me think of something. As I, I I take the train down from from Yorkshire, where I live, down to London, and I see massive uh, areas that uh, flooded from the heavy rains we've been experiencing in the UK. But the narrative there has never been that the flooding will cause migration or will cause the well. It, there, there is movement. You know, people are displaced from temporary displaced, and you know. But never about the, the, what I hear about uh, climate or, 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 you know, causing migration to from the south to 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 the northern countries. But yeah, I I I think there is there is a, a racialized um, discourse there that uh, obviously uh, towards a certain uh, group of of, of people uh, and 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 people from different regions that 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 we need to debunk. And I, I think I'll move us on to uh, the next question. And I I'll throw this question to you, Javier. And I'll uh, you know I'm 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 looking for the flaws of the current, especially the current current evaluation uh, of, of, of climate-induced violence. And I think we've started to, to kind of get into the, 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 grip, uh, the meat of it. And, but, you know, you, you've been uh, doing this work for, for some time, but I want to, to have your reflections on the, on the thing. Thank you. Thank you, Sarah. Um, yeah, I, I, you know, just to you know, build upon what has been said so far, I think we're all agreeing on this um, sort of scapegoating climate kind of a strategy that, that uh, the modern nation state uh, has in order to facilitate leg legitimization, right? The, mother, the modern state emerged from um, this projection of the idea of, of fear, right? Whether that fear be an external threat, an internal threat, like a, 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 a neighboring, you know, empire, um, you know, some sort of like internal subversive element, and now the fear is climate. But I think, you know, with this scapegoating strategy, what we are failing to see in the current evaluation of the climate crisis is, is the role of the modern international nation state system, right? And, and it, it's interesting to see how um, the nation state as, as a polity and, and, and the system that it has nourished, uh, you know, emerge with, with many pre premises in mind. I mean, one of them, perhaps the most important one is, is guaranteeing the security of its members. I think what states promise in return of obedience and, and subjection was, was security. And what we are seeing in the last few decades is how states in reality are enhancing the impact and vulnerability of its citizens. Uh, I, I'll mention a few examples of you know, how, how this enhancement happens. But for instance, the seemingly inflexible understanding of borders. Right? Borders are no longer functional to the sort of survival strategies that a, a global society really requires. Uh, the exclusionary um, structures of, of policies of relief and protection right? In the, in the event of a catastrophe, in the event of something that, that states speech as catastrophes, who gets relief, who gets assistance, gets to be decided on, on truly exclusionary politics that I'm, I'm very happy to unpack during the Q&A. 
And I think the other major flaw of the um, current evaluation of the climate crisis is related to uh, the role of the global circulate, global production and circulation of, of capital, right? Here, the, the, the foundational premise was more recent. You know, the market, you know, a market and sort of like a non-state line market will suffice to, for the production and distribution of wealth. But in reality, what we have experienced over the last few decades, particularly since the establishment of the neoliberal model, is a deliberate precarization and impoverishment uh, material and otherwise of the vast majority of citizens. You know, we're not talking about, you know, historically vulnerable populations or, or extremely racialized populations solely as the subjects of this impoverishment. You know, the, the narrative such as the 99% versus the 1% really signals how, how the impacts of um, um, climate and uh, social political crisis are affecting the vast majority of the population. And a couple of examples of these um, um, developments that, that are facilitating how these uh, impoverishments impact uh, uh, climate effects are um, uh, the rise of corporate ol oligopolies, right? So, so we are seeing a, it's a landscape, uh, economic and otherwise, of huge monopoly corporations that, that dominate everything, uh, the means of life and also the means of death for the vast majority of the global population. Uh, the narrative of extraction, right? How certain countries, you know, their only resort for survival is just embracing extraction at all costs, no matter what environmental or human consequences are. And uh, what um, uh, um, uh, James Moore and, 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 and Raj Patel called it the enduring cheapening of nature, broadly construed. The idea that, that nature as separate from society continues to be presented as this sort of like endless pot of something that can be transformed into an equally endless pot of wealth. I think all of these aspects need to be brought back into an, a major revelation of the holistic crisis that we're experiencing. Great. Um, Mara, I, I wonder whether you, you have anything to add on to that. It, that seems quite a comprehensive um, uh, discussion on the floor. I was looking at your at some of the work that you've done uh, previously, uh, Mara, on the, on the human security element, and I wonder whether that links up to what uh, Via is, is, is talking about there, about the nation state and yeah. Absolutely, absolutely. Uh, I, I think Javier's point about the state being the guarantor of the security of its population is sort of like needs to be nuanced as well, right? Like because the state becomes the producer of an insecurity uh, by promoting extractivism, by conquering land, by taking away land, land in the context of vulnerability. Um, and and of, of course, also by selectively doing it uh, towards more marginalized communities and all of that in the context of climate change. And we know that climate change is impacting areas and, um, you know, we can look at it globally, regionally, but also at the subnational level. You have areas, the urban rural divide is very interesting here because the rural communities often are the most hard hit when there's a situation of climate change. And I will give an example. For example, my, my last book was about, as I made the point before, debunking this climate-driven uh, thesis about the Syrian uh, uprising of 2011. And it, it sort of developed the, the thesis that because there was a very severe drought in 2006, uh, and because whole communities had to migrate massively uh, between 2006 and 2008, then you had instability uprisings uh, because of climate change. Actually, it's because the state failed to address climate change accordingly to the needs of the population. And it also implemented neoliberal reform policies, which lifted the subsidies to the rural communities at the time when they needed it the most, right? At the time of the very severe drought. So here we see how the state added to the insecurity that the populations have lived. And again, I want to say Syria has an experience of decades of drought. These communities have always adapted have always managed. And there were more severe droughts in the past. And in my book, I compare the situation with the previous drought, which was much more drastic. So why make that link? And again, that link was made uh, by US scientists, European scientists who had never set foot in Syria, who had never done research on Syria prior to, to you know, sort of enacting those theses. And why would they do so? Because Syria was in the news, dramatically in the news. and. It, it served the purpose of bringing awareness on climate change. But the problem is, 
it sort of distorted the analysis. And if you go back to the history, you see that the state played a major role by mismanaging, by failing to meet the needs of its population and dispossessing its population of benefits and support at the time when it needed it the most because the subsidies allowed the farmers to have you know, subsidies on pesticides, on diesel, allowing them to go and sell their crops. They were dispossessed of that because of neoliberal reforms, and then they migrated massively. And the point here is they're not the ones at the roots of the uprisings because they, were, they became the new poor, the urban poor. And again, it's penalizing migrants to say they're a source of instability. And the other point is the lack of agency here. There was a lot of work done in Syria on what was happening. And um, a lot of also the uprisings were about you know, contesting repression, authoritarianism, the Arab Spring, which really resonated in Syria. So I think it's important here to have a human security perspective. But again, I would say a critical human security perspective, because human security is a policy tool, which is good. It brings the focus on hum, you know, uh, human beings, communities versus state security. But it also fails sometimes at the policy level to look at the structural roots of the insecurity. So from a critical perspective, you look at the history of authoritarianism, of dispossession, and also we, uh, Javier mentioned uh, rightly so capitalism and neoliberalism. I think we need to mention also the legacy of colonialism, which also leads to neo-colonial capitalist practices of extractivism. Really, that, that it, it, it's very interesting because I, I, earlier this afternoon I was reading a collection of articles from different uh, that, that have been put together by the Humanitarian uh, Practice Network, brilliant articles that are linking climate uh, conflict and, and displacement. And in one of them, actually, there was um, I was reading one on South Sudan and exactly what you're saying that actually, you know, that the flooding that happens, but already it's a country in conflict and 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 majority of the conflict, whether it's state driven or whether the different uh, groups uh, in conflict with uh, or, or bringing about violence amongst the communities, but conflict isn't the reason that actually most of the people uh, 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 for this particular study, that that wasn't the reason they were moving. It was actually, um, it, it, you know, it, it was uh, the conflict was made worse by by some of the uh, by drought or by flooding, and and actually because, uh, but, but but also I think the most important part linking to to what you're saying was that the migration, the movement of of these communities. Ha always happened. They, 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 they always knew that uh, it was seasonal migration, and and there were patterns that were followed, and communities lived in harmony. Of course, they would always uh, sometimes have conflict, but you know, it's human nature. Conflict will, 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 will always be be there when when communities you know interact with each other. But I think there is lack, as you say, of looking at uh, at these issues in a more holistic and 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 I think. Uh, when you say the human security lens, but also a, a, a justice uh, uh, lens that uh, that 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 uh, that's limited. But uh, we we move on to to the next uh, uh, question, and I'll have, I'll pose this to you, Marwa, and and I know you're 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 speaking. Uh, you know you you challenged the 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 framing of of of, of this uh, um, uh, topic, and I'm going to pose the question to uh, both yourself and and Marwa, and ask how do you think then conflict impacts on climate, or how does con yeah how does conflict uh, impact on climate? So of course that's that's a, an important question, Sarah, because yeah. um, we 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 need to question and complicate the sort of deterministic link between climate change and conflict, and looking at the intervening variables, the context, etc. Now it is amply like research, uh, proven and and um, uh, um, research the the fact that armed conflicts, wars, have a massive impact on climate change. The, the carbon footprint of, of wars is massive. And I'll, I'll give you an example. There are different aspects here. There is the fact that you, know, you have the bombing, bombardments, which are uh, producing carbon, really impacting uh, uh, um, uh, the climate. There's also during conflicts, uh, the weaponization, 
by, by states and non-state actors of resources, which is even more impacting resource scarcity, but also uh, impact on the climate. And I, I'm going to give you a, a few examples from the region that I'm specialized in, the Middle East. Uh, we know in Syria, for example, that a lot of the states, Syria, the Syrian government, uh, Russia, all of the involved, the non-state actors, ISIS and others, have really weaponized resources. They have tried to capture water resources, to tame uh, populations into submission. Uh, they became military targets, military tools. We saw that in Yemen as well, where the coalition led by Saudi Arabia and the UAE has targeted ports, has targeted water infrastructures, creating famine and, and, and drought in Yemen until today. And more recently in the news, very uh, dramatic war that is happening at the moment, Israel's war on Gaza. And there was a research which showed that in the first two months of the war, uh, the, the carbon footprint of Israel's war on Gaza was equivalent to 20 countries. So imagine how much was released in the atmosphere. And this is poisonous for everyone, but primarily I would say for the people in Gaza. In addition, uh, with the in, in parallel to the uh, genocidal war that is impacting, you know, killing like uh, over 35,000 civilians, 70% of whom are women and children. There are almost 14,000, 15,000 children being killed. There is a toll on the environment and one could frame it as an ecocide, which is happening because all of the water infrastructures, all of the groundwater is being polluted when is the government, the Israeli government is, you know, flooding the tunnels with saline water. This is seeping in groundwater. And we're talking about a, a, a place where people already suffered from, you know, a drought, from water scarcity. They relied on the coastal aquifer, which is already polluted. In addition, now all of their water uh, infrastructures, the desalination, the wastewater um, uh, cleaning plants have been completely destroyed. So we have a situation today of ecocide where you have total thirst, people don't manage to drink, and we're talking about children dying from also thirst and starvation, and that has been used as a deliberate weapon in the war. And this is why the term ecocide is really starting to be coined when we talk about the massive impact of conflict on climate change. Again, Keeping in mind the massive impact on people and their environment is very important here to keep in mind. Yeah, and that that links to a question uh, uh, somebody has posted here on the on the chat about the link of of uh, 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 about uh, how conflicts are weaponizing water uh, and, and water resources, and you and you talk to that uh, quite uh, uh, quite clearly. But also, I, just to draw on some of the work, and I think uh, that you, uh, the, what you, you, you're drawing upon, uh, or the work of the conflict um, of, uh, and, and environment observatory that has been looking at the impact uh, of, of some of the wars, Ukraine, um, I'm, I'm not sure whether they've done uh, the Gaza, Israel, probably not yet. But they're looking at the impact of that, um, and and they've produced a really good reports uh, that I would uh, add people to have a look at, and 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 um, it it draws back. I, I kind of think of the work that I, I I do on explosive remnants of war, and you know, and what is often forgotten is that a post conflict, because you know, there is always the assumption that once the conflict is over, then you know we can start peace talks and and discussions, and you know, and all is well. But the majority of the work involves the clearance of these some of the explosives that are, are remaining on the ground. And there's recent research that is showing that even this work, as good and as 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 as, as intended, uh, uh, humanitarian intended, it actually is is contributing to um, to uh, an environmental degradation. And conversations now are being had about how they mitigate this. And which is which is a timely uh, discussions uh, that 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 is being had uh, within the sector, but there is that uh, element that I think uh, there was recently. I think people are beginning to talk about the eco side, uh, as as you call it. But I I see Javier, uh, you've uh, unmuted yourself, and I'll welcome your your thoughts and uh, on this. No, you 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 sorry, you were making such a good point because uh, I I. Try not to be that sort of annoying historian that you know always says like this was happening in the past and therefore there is lessons in the past uh, for for future challenges. But it's exactly what you're describing, right? Like we we have seen exactly where this narrative of climate overlapping conflict or conflict overlapping climate ends, right? 
and it ends in this sort of like mutually magnifying effect, right? Climate disturbances or climate events having this like completely inexorable capacity to magnify existent, current, ongoing social political turmoil. But then at the same time, the long aftermath of climate deepening the context upon which both conflict societies need to emerge. The examples, the historical examples for explaining these, for illustrating these are literally endless. One of the, the pieces I look at in, in my own research is, is El Nino, right? And that overlapping between El Nino and domestic or international wars is so constant. There, there's so much great scholarship written about it, uh, you know, Mike Davies, um, uh, Brian Fagan, and, and so many more. And um, yeah, it, it almost seems as if like once the opportunity for conflict emerges, the structures of power who have, again, wielded war for so long as such a pivotal source for legitimacy, just like feel this complete negligence towards anything else other than unfolding the conflict, winning, appropriating, centralizing resources as the, as the, as a pivotal outcome of that war without considering that sort of like material, environmental context upon which these power struggles occur. Great. Uh, yeah, uh, it's uh, interesting observations there. And um, I wonder then, moving on, how uh, what knowledge we need to, to have in order to have a really comprehensive understanding of the present and, and, and future challenges. Uh, I see, uh, Mara, you, you've unmuted. Yes, I, I just... I Yes. Go on, go if on, you allow yeah. me, Sarah, I just want to comment on the points that you made previously and, and Javier's point uh, about the impact of wars historically in, in contemporary politics. It's very important to realize that the massive, it, there's been studies researched on, on, on how polluting militaries are, and they are major polluters mm -hmm. in terms of climate change. And also the US Army, the military, the UK military, I mentioned Israel's wars in the region as well. What is interesting here is that military emissions are exempt from the 1997 Kyoto Protocol. And reporting is optional under the Paris Agreement thanks to US lobbying. So there's a zone here where the militaries do not want this to feature in, in discussions, and we should put it on the agenda. And I think it's very important to prevent lobbying in that sense. I want to add also the, the very interesting work you do about unexploded ordinances. There is this aspect in every war, the war continues even when the bombardments stop and it continues to kill people and children because they find these unexploded ordinances. And we know in Gaza recently, they found many of them still killing the children. There's another aspect which is very insidious, which is the toxic rubbles. When you have whole buildings and infrastructures which are destroyed by bombardments, they carry industrial and medical material, which is very polluting to the populations for generations to come. But unfortunately, it takes a lot of money to clean all of those toxic rubbles. It hasn't happened in Syria yet. And I've done a study on that to show how it's still polluting the populations. And we know for Gaza, the estimate to rebuild and clean and allow the populations to relive one day is over $100 billion. And imagine the, the, the massive amount that, that would be required and that will take generations to come. And again, pollution will still happen even though when the war uh, is stopped, although it's not stopped yet. But again, the toxic rubbles is another element, I think, very important element to, to consider when we talk about ecocide. And, and interesting that you bring, uh, uh, bring that point because uh, uh, a few summers ago, I was uh, in Angola uh, do, looking at the impact of uh, explosive remnants of war there. The war ended uh, over 20 years ago. Same thing in Somaliland, uh, there is still uh, elements of, of explosive remnants of war that are on the ground uh, that, um, that have been cleared. The war ended 30 years ago. So um, recently, I think there's research that was being looked at, at you know, with the war in Ukraine, the extent to which uh, the clearance and, and uh, uh, removal of all these explosive remnants 
that we'll take. And 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 again, I, I draw people on to, to the work of SEOPS, which actually is also looking at the military emissions and, and they've started uh, documenting that. Uh, so thank you very much for, for bringing that to attention and also for, for, for interjecting there. So, uh, you know, before we moved on to, to, uh, to the question on uh, what needs to be done. Uh, was that the question? Yeah, with the knowledge that we need in order to have a, a, a comprehensive understanding of the present and future. And I think that speaks to one of the questions that I've seen on the chat, uh, uh, so to speak. I'll, I'll come to you, Javier, before I, I, I ask uh, Myra to, to intervene. Thank you. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, knowledge is, um, you know, once again, I think, uh, you know, previous past experiences of overlapping of climate events and, and social political um, unrest, um, they, they seem, at least to me, to reveal a need for a reappreciation of, of certain um, societal skills. Um, I'll, I'll mention just three of them um, as, as, as an example. I think the first one that I want to mention is mobility, right? I think uh, mobility understood as the capacity of, of communities, individuals and communities, under threat to, to relocate and to relocate assisted by ruling powers uh, that require legitimization in times of crisis, right? So it's time to send a message also to these structures of power, be those nation states or uh, what you wish, to say that legitimization in the times of crisis that we're living right now can come in the form of assisting communities that demand mobility. Right. Uh, another one is uh, the relocation of these state sources for, for enhancing resilience and, and um, allowing the adaptability of communities, uh, particularly communities that are unable to move, you know, as, as you know, we have become larger and larger sedentary societies and, and this sort of like massive me me megalopolis that, that um, you know, weave together the, the global south in particular, you know, there are some communities that are unable to move. And, and I think they also deserve a great deal of, of um, resources for enhancing their resilience capacities. And, and a third one that I, I really wish we could we could impact during whatever Q&A time, Q time we have is, um, is psychological capacities, right? I, I think there's a psychological component to the crisis that we're living. This is affecting individuals, it's affecting communities. In, in in deeply hurtful way, ways at an emotional level. And I think a lot of the psychological impact of climate change is related to a certain incapacity to let go what we have held dear for, for very long, right? So yes, there are some existential threats that are posed upon us, but some of these existential threats are less related to our ontologies as a species and more related to our livelihoods, this, the way contemporary times and the Anthropocene, the Capitalocene, the Great Acceleration have built these livelihoods. And maybe, and um, you know, it's maybe it's a crazy idea, but there is some capacity to rethink these livelihoods and to let go about certain things that are not functional anymore for the life that we want and can live ahead of us. Wow. Um, uh, that's the, that's 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 quite deep, and I would I want to see, and I I don't think maybe you guys are uh, you know you you do this research or, or you you engage with this topic day in day out. You know mine is a, a bit you know I I I come in in stealth, but I I wonder I haven't seen any conversations on the psychological impact of of some of these issues, and and that's that's an interesting um, um, area that would you know seeing how the, the link. It is and, and and engaging in that uh, discourse. But uh, Mara, I, I see uh, you you want to jump in on, uh, on, on the on question, the question of, yeah. of what how to sort of address the future. The the your yes, yeah the future. yeah yeah the knowledge that we need uh, in order to have a comprehensive understanding of not just the future but even the present. Yeah, and I think the past as well, as Javier yeah, and mentioned. Past, yes. And I think I think for me, um, the environmental justice uh, angle is very helpful here in, in building that knowledge because it tells you to look into the roots of the vulnerabilities. And the, the tendency in the, we talked about narratives and discourses, the tendency is to really like isolate impacts of climate change uh, to say, well, this is happening in that context, we need to have mitigation, adaptation, etc., without going to the roots of the vulnerability. And I think there's nothing about climate change which is not political. 
societal, economic, human. And I think going to the roots of the injustices, because there are many injustices when it comes to uh, uh, climate, climate security and climate change, um, especially on the marginalized communities. There's a question in the chat about women's security. I think the gender gaps here are very, very important. Uh, I'm, I'm working on a new book on environmental justice in the Arab world and climate justice in the Arab world. And the impacts are always uh, m more dire for women and girls. When you don't have access to water, they need to go and walk out of their villages or out of their towns uh, far away. That means the girls don't go to school. That means the women can potentially be assaulted as well. So there is a dire impact here that needs to be corrected. And I think um, the knowledge about the roots of the legacies of colonialism until today, and I'm, I'm saying that still pointing out to the responsibility of local actors still. I'm not saying we should all blame it on colonialism, but we should not deny the legacies of colonialism, which colonialism is about conquering land, water, resources, uh, uh, wielding these resources for the profit of the colonizers or the profit of the occupiers, as we see in Palestine as well. I think there's a very interesting book by Mike Davis, uh, the Marxist historian, about the late Victorian Holocaust, where he shows actually that a lot of the societies in the global south were very prosperous and doing very well economically until the imperial powers came in and started looting, of course, these uh, these countries such as China, Rwanda. He goes into Ethiopia and other countries, and and that created famine. They manufactured a third world. So that there was no third world before imperialism, colonialism, etc. And the legacies are felt until today. And I think building that knowledge linking colonialism, also capitalism, the roots. If there's a situation of military occupation, we cannot just see what is happening. We need to look into the decades of military occupation, the impact on people and resources, builds the knowledge to, to better assess the impacts of climate change. And looking at also the different parts of the communities, I mentioned women, you have also indigenous communities who are often more impacted. I think Javier mentioned also the local and indigenous communities. And it's often interesting to know they have, you know, historical millenary knowledge about how to adapt to one's environment that has completely disregarded and it's completely swept away by extractivist policies and practices that we need to also protect and bring to the forefront. And that brings up very neatly to uh, the, the question that uh, I wanted to pose as a final question to both of you, or what voices are not being heard? What is it? What, what conversations are not being heard uh, in this space when we are looking at, uh, at issues of climate change? And then I will, I will uh, because I see quite a lot of a few questions on the chat so that we can go into Q&A. But just briefly, uh, just on, on, on some of the conversations or some of the voices that are not being heard. Um, if I may chime in quickly, because um, I, I, I understand the, the, the historical fascination and, and of course the, the importance of, of indigenous views around issues of, of climate change and adaptability. I, I think just, you know, I, I would like to publicly share this sort of cautionary word about signaling indigeneity as the holders of all the keys that we need for the future because it's placing the indigenous peoples indigenous communities indigenous activists as a focal target of all the structures of power that are repressing the emergence and consolidation of, of these knowledges so when evoking indigeneity i think there has to be a evaluation that indigeneity has been the byproduct of colonialism has endured colonialism and, and, and continues to exist despite manifold years, centuries of um, obliteration. And, and hence, you know, they, they have something to teach to the rest of the world. But um, in doing so, I think we're also creating some, some vulnerabilities that need to be acknowledged. And, and we, there are some securities that need to be uh, uh, granted to, to indigenous um, peoples, communities, and activists as they participate in these global conversations. But very quickly, other voices that are not being heard. I think it needs to be heard that war is not longer the sole vehicle for the legitimization of the structures of power. It's it's completely discombobulating and baffling to continue to see all these massive amounts of money 
I cannot remember what is the um, 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 the budget allocated for the uh, U.S. military complex. It's like eight hundred trillion dollars or something like that, uh, directed towards a machinery that, yes, for a long while was the sole vehicle for building estates, building empire. But you know, times have changed, and I think there there, there is a conversation to be said about that. And the other grassroots voice that I I would like to be or have heard is the voice of agricultural peoples farmers, campesinos, and particularly pastoralists, and other forms of nomadic peoples, people who have been continuing living on the move, who have continued embracing mobility and nomadism as their primary form of existence, who have whose nomadisms have been criminalized by these sort of like sedentarian nation states that are so fixated with a special, uh, a special fixation and allow, allow the redundance. And, you know, that sort of like living in mobility seems to be a very, very important skill to be upscaled in order to confront what we are confronting these days. Thank you, Javier. And I think that answers a couple of questions that were on the chat, because there's somebody who was asking about uh, uh, uncentral uh, knowledges and ways of life uh, of, of, of indigenous uh, nations and cultures. Uh, and how this can, you know, can address some of the challenges. And uh, I'll, I'll also open the question to Mara on on, on the same um, question on the voices and 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 the voices that are not being heard or the conversations that we are not having. So I, I agree that the agricultural communities. I think climate change. One of the really important impacts is food insecurity, and water and food are interlinked. And the impacts on agricultural communities is really devastating. And they're often left you know, abandoned by, by political and local structures. So I think the voices of the farmers, the agricultural, et cetera, communities is very important here. I mentioned women as well. I think we don't hear. And women within these agricultural communities are also pillars of, of these communities and their livelihoods. And they also carry, I think, the, the experience of dealing with arid environments. Um, I mentioned marginalized communities. There are racialized aspects. And we've seen, for example, in the Arab world, um, the Afro-Arabs are even more impacted because they happen to live in areas which are already impacted by drought, et cetera, and which are abandoned by, by the local government and the central government. And we're thinking about Afro-Iraqis, for example. Um, we're thinking about the Amazir in Morocco and other marginalized uh, communities, which also should be part of the conversation. And um, to go back to Javier's point about not being careful, about not having the indigenous communities becoming targets, right? They become the object of insecurity because they want to be the agents of their own security. And I think that's a very, very important point that I will keep in mind when I write about indigenous communities. Yeah, thank you for that point. I have an interesting question here that's been posed, and 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 it's somebody who says they are a climate film, TV, and digital story producer for a highly viewed climate uh, organization. And the challenge uh, that they pose is that the way in which people want to watch the Game of Thrones uh, than C-SPAN, um, so things have to be short and exciting, not lengthy papers. Uh, is there a story that links climate plus violence clearly that you feel is important to tell and that also has urgency in terms of getting worse as greenhouse gas emissions spiral, but perhaps has not been unpacked yet or one, one, you, uh, one you predict to keep an eye on? That's a, a, an interesting uh, question that throws us a little bit out of the, the realm of what we were discussing, but over to you. Javier, I don't know if you want to go ahead, but uh, I, 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 I have I, a case that I can that I can mention. Yeah, I, I would just very quickly mention probably lithium mining, right? And and the, that sort of like conundrum situation of lithium mining providing batteries or like you know the substance for batteries for electric cars that are seemingly contributing to lowering the impact on gas emissions particularly in the global north, in communities, affluent communities, they can afford electric, electric cars. And at the same time, they are creating this environmental and, and so, social devastation in, in spaces of extraction. And in many ways, it continues to resemble that classic sort of like global so, north, global south dynamic, you know, sort of dependency one-on-one. -on -one. 
but there is something additional. There is that additional layer of 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 like climate and consciousness, and and the consciousness consciousness of the privileged few that get to be satisfied, that get to be soothed at the expense of the suffering of uh, the vast majority of the disenfranchised poor. I would add to that, I think the critical minerals is a very, very important point here. I would add to that, uh, again here, the link is made between climate change and violence. Violence to whom? How, what type of violence? Are we talking about more instability, more wars, and the risk for the Western countries? Or are we talking about violence for their communities? And I think in that sense, we need to, the word violence is very uh, normative and problematic in my view. We need to always define it, always you know, state what we want to talk about. And in that case, I would say climate change violence and impact on the uh, marginalized, the vulnerable communities themselves. And I would think about a case, we know that, for example, you know, the uh, the Middle East is a hotspot of climate change, and there's been a lot of um, uh, heat in the last few years. For example, in Iraq, uh, in the summers, the last two summers, the heat has gone up to over 50% Celsius. And that's that's very high. And it's a country which has experienced heat, but that's heat which is they don't have AC, they don't have water, they don't have the means to adapt to it. And it has very severely impacted communities in the south of Iraq. And there's been rumors, it, the research, the data is still unclear. And I know there are some NGOs which are trying to document and going do, doing field work. But major rural communities and pastoralist also communities have been completely uh, rooted out. Had had to move away, lose their livelihoods, etc., and that's for me an example of violence, right? Violence to these communities because they were not protected and they were not provided to. And in that sense, we don't know much, but we know this will increase over the years, and it will be worse and worse as it hits even more uh, this country and the rest of the countries in the region. It's interesting you talk about the heat because I think over the news in the last few days that, that I've been here, I've heard that uh, there are some schools in uh, their, 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 their advisory is being issued on uh, because the heat uh, within the region is has become quite unbearable. And as you can see, I'm sweat, sweating quite profusely, but I haven't been angry. So um, that that um, that goes to to debunk the the, the 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 point that you were making earlier. But uh, one last question maybe is, what do the panelists say about the role of the global media that is intertwined with the industrial capitalism, especially with the respect of, uh, with the language and a uh, language of discourse? Who, do, who wants to go first? I mean, what yeah. is what is not to be said about media, right? Especially, especially corporate media. Right? I don't. I think this would warrant another another panel. Um, but um, yeah, I mean, I think we live in a in, in a world in which um, in the the means of information have been seized by by corporate interest, and and these corporate interests try to sell one idea, and the idea is that there there is a persistent threat against the livelihoods of everyday citizens. Uh, and that persistent threat is not climate, is not corporations, is not capitalism. That persistent threat is the other, is the external other or the internal other, right? Is the migrant who is crossing the border. It's your religious quote unquote enemy. It is that person who looks different to you. And no global survival will be within reach if we continue to buy the terms in which media discusses what the contemporary agenda should be. Mara? Yes, I, yeah. I, I think I think we, we all know how um, power laden the media discourse is. It's about who has the power, who has the financial means. And we see it when it comes to climate change. I just want to say this whole a uh, dominant narrative about climate insecurity and uh, the potential threat by migrants and uh, Syria being a climate-driven uh, conflict, the media has contributed to that. 
a lot, right? Looking, uh, claiming that, for example, Darfur was a climate-driven conflict when we know mm -hmm. there were many yeah. other issues. Uh, Syria was that. So there is also an agenda here. Like, uh, and as I said, it's also to bring awareness, but also to respond to the interest of those who think this is a sensationalist case that could feed interest and hence financing and, and awareness, et cetera. I want to say something else. Uh, th the alternative media have a role to play here. And I really think social media here are really trying to debunk all of that. And I, I just want to give an example with the Gaza war. The Gaza war in the official mainstream media is the perpetrator is never mentioned almost. It's always children being killed, population starving. We don't know who's starving. We don't know who's killing, although we know it's Israel. In that sense, and the echo side that is happening, the social media, the alternative media are offering a counter uh, uh, version, which is very important here. And that also links to, for example, the discussion that we had about walls and borders and racialized borders in the US, this idea of the flood of migrants coming from Central America, et cetera. It's not happening, right? And there are walls and there are campaigns which are being run on that. And thankfully, there are alternative social media who are able to document that. Or maybe I would say a bit more honest, some of the mainstream media being a bit more honest about it to try to get away from that politics of fear, which is very lucrative and very effective in bringing votes and bringing people because fear is a very, um, powerful mean to do it, yeah. Yeah, and, and, and I, I guess that there too uh, an, uh, an argument that also can be had about the 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 deep fake and uh, that that's uh, kind of uh, gotten hold of, of 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 communities and 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 social media seems to be a place where these uh, kind of uh, the really scary narratives are, are, are being perpetuated. But I, I, I have an interesting question here from uh, uh, somebody called Louis Okello. And he's, she's, uh, he's thanking you, uh, Marwa. Uh, I, I was, sorry, I've, I've gendered the person, but uh, uh, I've assumed that it's a male. Uh, thank you, Marwa, for bringing in the Syrian conflict in your discussion and how the narratives from the Americans and European scientists linking these to climate change, as well as the liberal policy introduced by the Syrian government that magnified the effect of the climate in the affected area, resulting into conflict. My question is, he, he says, could all these be deliberate actions aimed at creating crisis in Syria with the intention to, dis to depose the government, which does not align to the West's interests? Over to you. I, I don't think so. I, I wrote my book to say, and I dedicated my book to the Syrian people who joined the uprising. And I think in all of these conversations, we're not giving agency to the people. And um, but by writing that book, I wanted also to bring Syrian experts papers, Syrian expert voices, and the voice of the refugees and the migrants, which I interviewed in Lebanon and Turkey. And I had done interviews before the conflict in Syria. All of this to say, I think we need to give credit to the local people. And there's been like a talk about, of course, after the start of the uprisings, the second, you know, the first two years, there was a genuine popular uprising, even a revolution. And some people think the revolution still lives in the hearts and minds of people. And they stood up against repression, um, authoritarianism, dictatorship, and they got a, they paid a very, very heavy price. And I think I want to give credit to all of the women and the men and the children who died for that idea. Having said that, the war evolved afterwards into a regional global war with the US intervening, the Russia, Iran, uh, everybody, Hezbollah, etc. And it became something else than this popular revolution. It's been hijacked. So I, I don't think, I think the climate driven conflict sort of negated the agency of the Syrian population. And this is why we, I needed to debunk it in my research. At the same time, by giving back the agency to the people is to also give back the agency to the revolution and its genuine popular non-armed roots in the beginning for the first two years. And then of course, later on, it was hijacked into something else. And by the way, until today, uh, you know, parts of Syria are being bombed by 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 the Syrian government, by Russia, the Northwest. Um, it's it's not resolved yet, and people are still detained in prisons. People are being killed and tortured. So I think we need to really be careful about um, negating what happened in 2011 in Syria. 
Great. Well, uh, another question that's popped uh, is, um, uh, sorry, I've lost, uh, I've lost it there. Is somebody asking whether there is a community that they could join uh, to continue to learn and participate in some of these important themes, uh, especially of human security, conflict, and climate change? Uh, and I'm sure both of you are well placed to 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 respond to to that question. Mar Javier, do you want to? Marwa, you, you go first. I'm, I'm still thinking about organizations. and I was hoping you would go first. Um, <laughs> uh, communities in the sense, intellectual communities, or there's a lot of critical security studies perspectives on climate security. Uh, I, I think the angle of environmental and climate justice is a very interesting and compelling and powerful one. I would urge you to join these you know, res new research agenda. There's a lot of uh, again, it goes back to indigenous communities, and Javier would know more about the campesinos and others who mobilize. There is South South solidarity here, and uh, I recently met a former student who went to Colombia to attend a meeting, and she's Palestinian. She went from Palestine to really uh, sort of uh, contribute to a conference about decolonizing sustainability and, and promoting emancipation. So I think there is a possibility here through the environmental justice agenda to promote uh, these rights and, and to make those voices heard. If you're interested in debunking this idea of climate crisis, I saw in a lot of the questions, should we talk about climate crisis or is that really contributing uh, to the problem? And I think we need to nuance that as well from a justice perspective. Yeah, and maybe just to add on to that, I think there's a, a growing field on environmental peace building and, and that draws quite a lot of these uh, discussions, debates on, natural resources, uh, transitional justice issues. In fact, just yesterday, a colleague of mine uh, uh, who's also in, in the Environment Office Building uh, uh, Association uh, space uh, was uh, moderating a discussion linking transitional justice issues in, in this. So there's quite, uh, there, there, there are a few communities depending on what uh, the, the person who posed the question on, on, on communities, what the interpretation of the communities is and of course the forum that we are uh, we we are having uh, uh, here is is also a place where these uh, these discussions can be had. But uh, I will uh, let Javier also contribute to the to to that question. Just just very quickly adding, um, I, I think one of the I, I live in Western Massachusetts um, um, near Northampton, and um, th this is a, a a place that is um, uh, particularly um, full of, of farms. Uh, and, and and there is this sort of like reflection that uh, stemmed from my students and who, we were doing this class on crops and capitalism and, and the reflection was, you know, where does your food come from, right? And when we started tracing where does your food come from, we, we look at like sort of local, state and national and also international networks of food production and food circulation. And I think sooner than later that will get you to who makes the things that you consume in your breakfast and your lunch. And seeing them not just as producers of commodities or goods or crops, but also of knowledges and, and knowledges that are particularly relevant to these conversations will make you aware that, um, you know, these are communities that are constantly discussing these. These are highly political, highly intellectual communities in sort of unconventional frameworks to what we typically understand as, as intellectual conversations. They're not college frame. They're not university frame. Uh, and um, there, there is a great deal of wisdom available there. So, you know, talk to your local producers, talk to local farmers, talk to talk to everyday people. You know, there there are communities out there with with less institutional contours, with with no clear institutional contours, actively talking and discussing and acting on, on these issues. So another another thing that, that another question that may be uh, that's been posed is you know we've been convened by the uh, HFG I'm not going to try and pronounce uh, that uh, foundation and what what do you think or what should donors and 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 funders like HFG and others be thinking about when it comes to climate and uh, and philanthropy. 
and, and maybe maybe to uh, uh, maybe open the discuss to uh, give give uh, give my own response. What I see in especially in in the field in the sector that I I work within is that there are quite a lot of siloed responses, uh, whether it's by donors or whether it's research, you know, and and a lot of lack of. Uh, integrating or or, or 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 thinking in 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 sort of an integrated way about how these uh different elements uh or uh, different uh situations emerge or or converge so for example if you're talking about humanitarian responses or development responses or peace building responses you know those 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 different um uh I, uh, sectors kind of think in solos and uh, silos and don't em embed some of this knowledge. And I think uh, maybe working across um, sector and having foundations or uh, or donors that are, 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 are kind of deviating from the that kind of approach where they, they will uh, provide funding for certain uh, activities and delink them from, from that is is to for us, I think the challenge for, for 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 such uh, communities is to try and see how these things work in a in an inter integrated way, and I think within that is to uh, prioritize uh, you know those responses that actually um, give uh, local communities uh, the agency the, uh, that that prioritize the voices of local communities. That would be for me the the what 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 this. Uh, Policymakers or, or, or donors would 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 uh, would you know I would recommend that they 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 be thinking about. But I'll, I'll I've seen both of you have unmuted, and I'll welcome your views on that. Do you want to go first, Marwa? If if I may, Javier, just uh, I want to comment quickly first on the environmental peace building. I'm afraid I'm very critical about this uh, sort of. Of course, uh, peace building is is always very important. Environmental peace building would be great. The problem is it's sort of takes away the attention to um, to the, the, the political context. It sort of brings a technocratic sort of perspective to say we can cooperate over water sharing. Uh, let's have the engineers meet. But then we forget what is happening beyond that. And I think it's been used a lot, for example, in the case of Palestine, Israel, to say, well, let's have a peace process where we talk about sharing water. And unfortunately, the Oslo peace process in the West Bank and Gaza has brought about the institutionalization of hegemony under the disguise of cooperation. So I think, again, we need to nuance what we mean by environmental peace building. And, and I'm thinking about several cases where it could be implemented as a good way for donors to think we're doing something, but they're actually uh, contributing to the roots of injustice when they don't deal with the political aspect as well. And in terms of solutions for the policymakers and donors, I think identifying and supporting country and grassroots Adaptation. One example we talked, uh, Javier mentioned food, investing, for example, in climate smart food systems, helping countries to have that, to choose the type of crops that would be adaptive to, to climate change, and to provide support to local organizations. Again, not central states, local actors, local organizations would be a way to do it. I think the issue of reparations is very important, reparative measures. And again, that I link it to climate justice. Reparations for climate injustices, occupation, war, um, and, and helping in green post-conflict reconstruction phases, what we call environmental health. There is a need for accounting what happened in the past. If you have a perpetrator of war and destruction not being held accountable, or formerly colonial power also not being held accountable, there's a way of compensation here which could provide, and I know policymakers would hate it. They want quick fixes. They, want, they don't want to talk about the history and the legacy. But then their quick fixes are very short-sighted and, and short-term. Uh, they end up not working in the long term. If you want real adaptation and really uh, mitigation, we need to address really what vulnerability is about and what caused that vulnerability. What, what can I add to that, Marwa? Um, um, so I'll, I'll say very quickly three things. A, you know, this is what donors and policymakers should hear, for me at least. A, climate does not induce violence or conflicts. It does not. Right? It's not as simple as that. And, and yes, as Marwa just said, you know, I think policies require an oversimplification of reality, but we need to cope with the idea that this is not a simple monocausal situation. 
Uh, B, I think um, there has to be enough resources available for research on, on um, you know, dissecting and interrogating the structures of institutional power. And I also think we need to accept the fact that the knowledges that get to be produced out of that research will feel subversive to these structures of power and will feel uncomfortable. And, and that's okay. And probably the most uncomfortable and the most subversive this knowledge gets to be, the more useful is going to prove to be for confronting our challenges. And then, you know, um, just enhancing mobility, adaptations, um, coping with loss and grief and, and remaking. I think that's where um, our our next avenues also lie. Yeah, uh, one more question here, which is uh, interesting. How does one distinguish between weaponized climate change discourse and authentic concerns? The criteria is not clear. Cre uh, the criteria is not clear for making the distinction between these two species. Uh, your your thoughts on that? Um, I, I think, again, um, looking at discourses, think about framings. If you have, you're reading a, a paper or a media news, something which tells you, oh, this is, this violence is only climate driven and not taking into account, not providing information analysis about the local context, about the historical context, about who the actors are. And, and again, adopting this like very simple, you know, narrative about the essentialist deterministic link, I would be concerned about that. I don't know why. I think sometimes it serves the interest. It's also, you know, uh, sometimes in the media and others, people want to be read. They write articles so that they can sell. Uh, so in that sense, it, it brings more attention. And people don't want to read too long articles. So I would, I would look for sources which are well-documented, which are well-argued, which have evidence sources that are or interviews with the relevant people and not external actors if you're talking about a case in africa or the middle east i would expect to have an expert from the region or possibly a local actor from the region providing their insights and in that sense this would be an authentic concern and and again climate change is happening this is what we're saying the question is how is it leading to insecurity is what we need to think about and reflect upon yeah, I, I would I would just say if if the discourse that you are listening to or reading it's infused with fear and exclusion, then be doubtful. It has to be infused with hope and solidarity, and solidarity across any borders, any frontiers, any kind of contours, any compartmentalization. Solidarity and hope, or otherwise we're lost. That's a very good point. Very good point. But uh, I mean, I, I think we we coming towards the the end of the the the, the Q and A. And uh, my fin the final question would be, uh, what new roads we see for research around this topic, and 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 what are the important research questions that need to be asked? Uh, there are uh, still, I think there there were quite a few uh, questions uh, on the chat, but I think some of them have been answered through uh, the interventions that you've made, and 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 hence the reason that I'm asking the, 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 this question on 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 research and and the topic that we 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 find we see uh, as being important for us to ask uh, at the end of it. I can jump in if you want, Javier. Yes, sure. uh, I, I think we, we've tackled a bit, like meaning what, what to tell policymakers, but in terms of research agenda, um, again, I think this issue of reparations, in my view, is very important. And it's coming uh, in the US, there's a discussion about reparations for slavery, which is very important. And you have also scholars who link it to climate change impacts, uh, thinking about the impacts of Katrina in New Orleans and how the local populations were even more impacted and abandoned. And they're also descendants of slaves. So there's this double penalty, which is happening as we think about climate injustice. And I think it's happening elsewhere in the world as well. So reparation is, is very controversial. Um, people think, well, uh, if you're held accountable, why are you paying for what your ancestors did? But there is a historical responsibility here. And I think all of the agreements around climate change also account for that by coining the term differentiated responsibilities. 
the prosperous industrialized countries have created most of the climate change impacts today. They are the sources of climate change, so they should be held accountable and sh they should help the rest of the world to adapt, mitigate, etc. And that doesn't mean that we're not all involved in climate change measures. That means we need to bring the global south, but they need to be helped in doing that. And for example, the Green Fund is a way also of doing it, but it, the pledges have not been fulfilled entirely by the nations which have made the pledges. So I think all of this question of climate justice, differentiated responsibilities, reparations is worth thinking about and doing more research about and, and thinking also another aspect which links to your question, Sarah, about conflict and climate. I think the protection of the most vulnerable. We know there are, I mean, I'm talking about civilians, of course, women, children, migrants, against the impacts of climate change, but also wars. And the issue of ethics and norms in times of wars, we have the Geneva Conventions, starvation is prohibited, uh, making people thirsty is prohibited, targeting the environment is prohibited by the Geneva Conventions, but we need to make it really enforceable, a taboo, and to hold the countries which do that accountable for their actions. The use of explos certain explosive remnants of war as uh, prohibited, and and yet, as we as you say, we keep seeing this uh, happening over and over again. Um, the use of white phosphorus bombs, for example, sir, also, which is a war crime, which is being used now in Gaza and South Lebanon. All of that should be part of this discussion. We cannot have these weapons, which are prohibited, being used because we think nobody's paying attention, the media is looking away, etc. When there's evidence that it's being used. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, I, I just yeah, want to yeah. add one one more element, insisting on uh, climate restorative justice. I think it's it's absolutely essential. Um, most of the global south throughout the last three or four decades went through some sort of conflict that required a version of a truth and reconciliation commission with different names. I would expect to see something like that related to climate, right? That's this creation of an, a power national, power state, or super state organization that provides a comprehensive treatment of what happened in terms of climate and conflict overlapping, affecting and deepening the vulnerability of the disenfranchised poor. And um, I think another line of inquiry that I would like, I would like to pay attention to is um, in, if, if all of this is the, is the making, the ultimate making of uh, deep capitalist trends, can, can we exist beyond capitalism sort of existence uh, and life beyond capitalism, uh, futures beyond capitalism. Uh, I think that will be intriguing to see. Uh, just a question to both of you. I think you've mentioned it, and, and I wonder whether that uh, also uh, links to uh, issues uh, of transitional justice. Is that a separate discussion you see, or, or is it uh, the, the term transitional justice uh, sep uh, similar to what uh, you're, you're both describing when it comes to climate uh, uh, justice? and Okay, uh, the, um, the Truth and Reconciliation uh, Commission that was applied in South Africa was very, very effective in bringing accountability, responsibility uh, in terms of the apartheid system and, and at the same time um, exempting, like providing a possibility for coexistence. And I think the dilemma today is the, the former colonizing powers um, and the, the, the oil producing countries how do you get them to uh, help this process of transitional justice? And, and we need one because we need accountability. We need a historical process. We need to look back at the structural roots of violence, of climate change as a violent conflict, as a violent process, actually, which is very much impacting the most vulnerable around the world. So I think reparation is, is for me, the way forward. There's the idea of repairing what happened, but at the same time moving forward. I don't know the, uh, I mean, Javier, you mentioned restorative justice and a form of transitional justice. I don't know how to institutionalize it, but I guess uh, in some of the future agreements that will be negotiated, there will be the need to maybe possibly include those terms uh, beyond differentiated responsibilities, green fund, to have maybe the ethical and normative aspect 
and the accountability being really put on paper and signed on. I don't know how feasible that will be, if the US will sign it, if, if other countries will sign it, but that would be a way forward and a way to account for historical injustices. Yeah. And and I think we're seeing some some evidence of of that development in in you know a lot of young scholars work around sort of an environmental angle to social political conflicts and in context in which truth commissions emerge and how you know the environment or climate um, events have been absent from the historical reflection that surrounded the analysis of these these historical episodes. Um, so yes, I think it's it's a it it seems to be a very unsurmountable task. Right to, you know, like institute all these similar legal architecture around an event such as climate or in global warming that feels as diffuse and as quote unquote natural, but you know, institutional accountability, as Marwa said, is is the way to go, and an understanding that as other processes, as social political conflict, as violence, as civil war. This has been a historical experience. It has been a historical experience that has been experienced differentially. And it requires this sort of like very complex, very nuanced and greatly sophisticated understanding that includes causes, responsibilities, recommendations, and reparations. Great. This has been quite an interesting discussion. I've learned quite a lot from uh, listening in and, 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 and interacting with you. And also, I appreciate that because the, the uh, preparing for this session has drawn me into your work that I would probably would not have been, uh, you know, wouldn't have come into my radar. So I appreciate that. Uh, uh, there's been quite a lot of interactions on, on chat. I apologize to those who uh, we've not uh, responded to directly. Uh, keep the conversations going uh, and I'll throw this uh, uh, podium to back to uh, Nyeleti. Thank you very much. Thank you, Sarah. Wow, what a conversation. I'd like to thank Marwa Daoudi, Javier Puente, and Sarah and Jerry once more just for leading us through such a rich conversation. It was really a discussion that pushed back on dominant narratives about climate-induced conflict, the impact of war, and highlighted the impact of war and conflict on the environment itself, the echo side that Marwa raised. Uh, the psychological impact of current and past experiences of climate change, uh, the historical realities of colonialism, capitalism, and militarism on the impacts of climate uh, climate change, especially in what we refer to as the global south, and finally looked at the true intersectionality right of climate with other types of vulnerability. Um, and so, as is often the case, this conversation really could have continued for several more hours, uh, but I do have the duty of bringing us to a close and thanking not only today's speakers, but everyone that joined us today, those of you who posed your questions uh, and comments in the chat. Um, this video, along with the summary of the discussion and questions for further research, will be made available on hfg.org. Uh, and we hope, shameless plug, that you will join us for our next installment of our speaker series, which will take place on Thursday, May 2nd. Uh, this conversation titled Local or Global, the Future of Peace Building in Africa will explore the tensions that often exist between the international peace building agenda set by the UN and local implementation realities. Uh, this will actually be an in-person event. It'll take place at HFG's office here in New York. So we invite you to attend in person or to register via Zoom if you're not able to, uh, to travel this way. Um, and again, that's available on hfg.org. Uh, as always, please follow HFG on our social media platforms for more information about our speaker series, about other events, our publications, grants and funding opportunities. You can follow us on Twitter at HF Guggenheim and on Facebook and LinkedIn at Harry Frank Guggenheim Foundation. Thank you all once again, and we hope to see you at the next installment of HFG's Knowledge Against Violence speaker series. Thank you, Marwa, Sarah, Javier. Thank you so much. Great conversation. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you very much.